so over the next three weeks, we are uh, going to be talking about the documents of the church. And let me give you um, some background as to why we're doing that, and then maybe some direction with how we're going to move forward uh, in the coming weeks during the Sunday school class. As you know, we just finished our series on union with Christ, which I thought was uh, really, really good. And I hope you were blessed by that series. Um, it was a joy to be able to go through that in our Sunday school hour. And so uh, coming up now, though, uh, what we plan to do during Sunday school is coordinate uh, our Sunday school teaching with the teaching that goes on uh, on Sunday night on the essentials of church doctrine and practice. So as you know, we, we've switched things up on Sunday nights. We've moved from um, uh, doing the essentials series on Sunday mornings to part two in the essential series, now dealing with the church, our doctrine and practice on Sunday nights. And the way we're you know, framing those is one subject, one sermon, one hour on those subjects essential to the life, health, growth of the Christian, and in particular now, um, our study on the church, church doctrine and church practice. So, to coordinate with that, um, we like to try to coordinate our studies if possible so that you're, um, we're covering one subject more broadly over several different teaching points in the church. Helps us to retain those things a little bit better, a little bit easier when we do that. Um, gives you a good immersion in whatever subject it is that we're covering. And so we want to try to coordinate now with Sunday school on Sunday morning. So our plan is, is um, during this hour, is to do a series on the church. And not um, just um, maybe a basic series on the church, but a series that will enable us to cover some subjects that we really feel like are critical and important at this point in time to be covering. And so uh, one of those, uh, or one section of that study during the Sunday school hour will be on the regulative principle of worship. So what I'm anticipating for that may be five or six weeks on how to think about the regulative principle, how to apply the regulative principle, how that applies to both our doctrine and our practice, our worship and our functions here at the church. So we'll talk about that some. But then uh, I think we will um, attempt to start a relatively a lengthy or longer study on the relationship of church to state. And we'll talk about uh, the relationship of the church to our government, the role of the church, the role of the government, the, the authority of the government, the authority of the Lord's church, um, the priority of the Lord's church, the relationship between the two, and what I think we will get into with that is uh, what, we're, what we would call a, a theology of public life or a, a theology of politics or a theology of Christian resistance, uh, which I think is going to become increasingly important as time goes by. Uh, this is something that we as a church are going to have to understand, understand well, and we want you to be thoroughly and well equipped with how we... Um, understand those things. And so we'll look at several texts in the Bible. We'll look at several subjects, you know, a little shot across the bow, if you will, were, were the uh, mask ordinances or the mask mandates uh, not too long ago here that were uh, dished out by our county and our state, our country. And there's more of that coming. So uh, we want to uh, help you help ourselves become well prepared uh, as we see those things increasing. Many of you may have heard last week the pastor in uh, um, Canada that was arrested, apparently uh, still uh, in jail, uh, separated from his family over this issue of worship. And um, so the, the people of God need to be prepared for uh, the persecution that's coming, the difficulty that's coming. And so we want to spend some time doing that. We'll also get into uh, the church and social justice. So in other words, when we think about that, that a series on the church, that's sort of along the lines of what we're thinking. Um, in particular, uh, a bit of time on regulative principles, not something that we ordinarily get to spend a good bit of time on. I think that'll be really helpful to you. But then into um, the theology of Christian resistance or a theology of public life, a theology of, of uh, social justice. And so we'll talk about that more as we go. So we begin this morning, though, we thought would be helpful with uh, the documents of the church. We've come now to, I know Pastor Dale, the guys working on the essentials class, are getting to the end of their first rotation uh, with many of the, the folks who are candidates for membership involved in that class. And so the last three lessons are from really from part three in this new essential studies that, that we'll be rolling out soon. 
that deal with um, specific issues related to membership. Uh, three of those are the documents of the church. And when we say documents of the church, we, we're thinking of constitution, covenant, and confession, right? Constitution, covenant, and confession. I didn't do that alliteration. That was laid out for me. Uh, so <laughs> that's what they're called, uh, constitution, confession, and, uh, and uh, covenant. Thank you. <laughs> Already forgetting. Uh, so we're going to be talking about those three documents over the next three weeks. Um, and we'll do that um, for a few reasons. One is that these documents in our church really are living documents. They are not dry, dusty, um, Microsoft 98 <laughs> things that we keep in a file or put on a shelf somewhere. Uh, these are documents that we use. We refer to on a regular basis. They are very important in the life of our church. And so we want you to be well familiar with those documents. We introduce them when someone uh, comes for membership. We spend some time talking about them. And in some senses, we do rely on you to uh, understand those and to read those, to be familiar with those as we conduct church life around here. But this is a good opportunity for us to spend a little bit of time on each of the three of those documents. And I think as we go through that, you'll see the reason why that's important. Um, practicality, the practicality of those documents uh, requires regular review, requires us to regular, regularly refer to them. And so you'll hear us in our church regularly refer to our confession of faith. We often do that during sermons, uh, in particular the essential sermons on Sunday night now. Uh, you'll hear us do that during the essentials classes, during Sunday school. Um, you'll hear us refer to our covenant on a regular basis. And I, the members here will know that during Membership Matters, for example, we're reciting our covenant together every single time we meet. It's a, a, a document that has significance to us, and it should, and we need to be reminded of that. Uh, the one that is um, probably least familiar to you and maybe sort of least um, out in the open, so to speak, in our practice as a church is the Constitution. Uh, but the Constitution is a framework by which we do many of the things that we do and very intentional document. And so I pray it'll be a help to you this morning to review that. Uh, we also have many new members, many new attenders in our church, uh, many new prospective members. And we thought that a review of our documents in this way would also help them as they prepare for membership. So our objective then in talking about the documents of the church beginning this morning with the Constitution will be one, uh, to review the basis for their general use. What is a constitution for? Why do we have one? We'll review the basis for their general use. We'll review the reasons for their specific form. Uh, why does our constitution take the form that it does? Uh, what purpose does it serve? How do we employ it? And then we'll provide an overview of their basic content. We'll look, given the time left, we'll look at uh, the basic content of those documents and review that together. Okay, so those are our three objectives. We're going to review the basis for their general use. We're going to review the reasons for their specific form. And then we're going to provide an overview of their basic content. And frequently at our church, I get questions on a regular basis about some matter uh, in our Constitution. I think more frequently what we get is um, questions related to the use of church covenants. Uh, where have church covenants come from? Why do churches use them? Are they biblical? And what is their biblical basis? And so next week we're going to deal with um, covenant and uh, we're going to look at a Baptistic uh, background, a biblical background for the use of covenants. I think that's going to be really helpful. And then we'll get an overview of our confession uh, three weeks from today. Okay, so if you need them, we have uh, these documents. Nikki was very gracious to help us lay these out. And we've got these copied. Leela copied them, I think, yesterday. And we've got these at the welcome desk for you. So it'd be good for you to have a um, hard copy in your hands. That's available to you. But also, let me make a shameless plug for our church app. I don't have my phone with me. But if you download our church app, um, uh, at the bottom of our homepage on the church app, there's a little resources button. And if you click on resources, and then under resources, if you click on members, right up front on that members page in our church app, you'll see um, Constitution, Covenant, and Confession. And it's all laid out. It's laid out with hyperlinks, so you can go to our table of contents. You can click on whatever aspect you want to look at. It'll take you straight to that page in our Constitution or in our confession. Um, really, really excellent the way that Eggers laid that out and really helpful. So I want to encourage you. Um, we have these handouts, the, these outlines available. So if you need one of these, maybe the brothers can 
pass those out. Josh is coming around with constitutions. And then if somebody wouldn't mind grabbing a stack of outlines, uh, these outlines are available to you also, help you follow along. <clears throat> okay, let's begin. We're talking about this morning then, uh, the Cornerstone Constitution, the Constitution of our church. Thanks, brother. Okay, when we think about heading number one then, <clears throat> the basis for its general use what is the basis for the general use of a constitution? Why do churches have constitutions? First, uh, I think this is really important, is necessary church order. Necessary church order. Uh, the use of a formal and legal document called a church constitution arose in response to the need for increased order in the Lord's church, in the local church, in the local body of believers. And we begin with that premise uh, that the Lord's church should be in order from Scripture. We find that in Scripture in several places. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. We as believers should know how we are to conduct ourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. As we learn uh, to understand how we are to conduct ourselves in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, obviously we take um, all that we understand, all that we know from the Bible, and we apply that to church life, and that's how we're to understand how we are to live with one another uh, in the church. But where constitutions, where covenants, where confessions have come from really is a, a systematizing of those scriptural principles, scriptural commands. It's a systematizing of what the Bible teaches and arranging that in an orderly fashion so that it's easy for us to see and understand as we apply it directly to church life. And so that's where uh, a confession, a constitution, a covenant comes from. We'll talk about that more as we go, okay? Let's talk about the general basis then, or a general biblical background. And to do that, turn with me to Colossians chapter two. Let's just take a look at a couple of texts, all right? We're talking about the basis for its general use, the basis for the general use of a church constitution and where that came from. Colossians chapter two, and beginning in verse one. Now, as Paul writes here, uh, just like in Rome, as we're going through our uh, series on Romans on Sunday morning, uh, Paul greatly desires to visit this church in uh, Colossae. He greatly desires to visit the Colossians. And so he so it says, um, he gives a purpose for that visit in verse, beginning in verse one. Consider this purpose with me. Paul says, for I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, so that, here's the purpose statement, right? Verse two, so that one, their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, two, attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding, and three, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So Paul wants to visit the Colossians, visit the church at Coloss, and he wants to do that for three purposes. Their hearts may be encouraged, they may attain to all the riches of full assurance and understanding, and three, they may attain to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Jesus Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But then he gives a theological reason for his visit. Verse four, now I say this, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. In other words, Paul wants to come visit them. Paul wants to teach uh, because Paul knows that false teaching can take root in the church and he wants them to avoid deceitful traps of the false teachers that Paul has already mentioned in this letter, okay? But then there's a personal a personal reason also, verse five. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. All right, so Paul absent. We're gonna talk about tonight in the, the sermon this evening uh, about the communion of the saints, but that's what's going on here with Paul and these believers at the church uh, in Colossus. It's what's going on with Paul and the church at Rome in Romans chapter one, right? There's this spirit-wrought communion of the saints that exists between believers based upon his spirit, based upon what we believe and why we believe it, based upon the work of the spirit in our hearts that unites us together in love, unites us together in faith. We're in union with Jesus Christ, and by virtue of our union with Jesus Christ, we're in union with one another. And that's, that's that heart reason why Paul longs to go and see them, why he wants to be with them, right? He is with them in spirit, 
That's exactly what Paul's talking about. It's the communion of the saints. And he's rejoicing. Now, what is he rejoicing in with respect to them? He's rejoicing in their good order and the steadfastness of their faith. That's interesting, isn't it? Good order and steadfastness of faith. The word for order is toxis, toxis, orderly conduct. The word for steadfastness, the steadfastness of your faith is stero, uh, steroma, <laughs> steroma, if I can pronounce that correctly. Now, these are um, considered by many to be military terms, right? Military terms. Um, taxis refer, referring to good order or a lining up of soldiers in a battle ray, right? If you can imagine a uh, Roman guard, for example, and they're all lined up in their armor, lined up with their weapons. They're in good military order. And then stereoma, meaning a steadfast or firm, referring to the strength of that order. Uh, lined up in battle array, shields uh, out, swords drawn. Uh, there's a firmness uh, or a stability to those battle formations. Um, the church at Colossus is in good, disciplined military order, <laughs> and that order is firm and secure, uh, and that is something that Paul is rejoicing in. Um, working order, defenses are well-established, well in place, and it suggests that the Colossians are running a tight ship. Uh, they're running a tight ship, a disciplined ship, and therefore, running a tight ship, running a disciplined ship, the church at Coloss is well prepared to defend themselves against attack. Uh, in particular, in context, it's uh, uh, the attack or the threat from false teaching, false teachers, um, but we could conceive of many ways in which the church is under attack, couldn't we? That good order would serve us well to defend ourselves against that attack, right? So good order, a steadfastness, a firmness in our faith and good order will defend us uh, against threats, against trouble, against attack. It's the same word, toxis. It's the same word used in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. Paul says in verse 33, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And in verse 40, Paul says, let all things be done then decently and in order. Same word. In uh, Titus chapter one, verse five, turn over to Titus chapter one, verse five with me. And we're talking about the basis for the general use of a constitution in the church. And the first basis for the general use of a church constitution is necessary church order. In chapter one, Titus chapter one, Beginning in verse four, to Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And he tells Titus, for this reason, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking, set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. The word order there is epidiorthao, epidiorthao. It's... Um, referring to um, something that's not in complete order, something that needs additional order, right? Um, Paul is leaving Titus in Crete so that Titus can further order those things in the churches of Crete, right? He can set things in order. He can further organize that which is lacking. The things that are lacking are plural and then Paul gives a representative example. He is to appoint elders in every city. So I think from the, um, the indication by the plural, right, the things plural that are lacking, that in the churches of Crete, there were several things that were lacking. In any church, there may be several things that are lacking, but chief among those would be elders that needed to be appointed in every city. So of the things that are lacking in a church, leadership is of primary importance. It is of primary importance that Titus appoint elders, and then elders can help with putting things or setting things in order, those things which are lacking, okay? But the point of this all is that with respect to a church, um, there is to be order in the church. Um, there are those things which are lacking that pertain to order, that pertain to governance, that pertain to polity, uh, pertain to how we live and conduct ourselves in the household of God. And these things are to be put in order. In everything, Paul says, let everything be done decently and in order. And with that church in Colossus, Paul is um, impressed. He's rejoicing in their good order. All right, so 
the basis, the, the basis of its general use, why would we have a constitution, is to facilitate good order. Okay, any questions about that so far? All right, so a constitution helps us to facilitate good order. Second on your notes there in the outline, that order, good church order, is a, a responsibility of autonomy. It's a responsibility of autonomy. And what do we mean by that? Uh, Baptist churches, all churches are supposed to be, but Baptist churches are autonomous. It comes from uh, one word, autonomos. Auto meaning self, namos meaning law. In other words, autonomous means self-governing or self-directing, self-regulating churches. They are self-governing, self-regulating under the lordship of Jesus Christ, but each local church is responsible for its own order. So order in the church is a function of our autonomy. We don't go to a denomination for order. We don't submit ourselves to a hierarchy for order. We don't go to cardinals and bishops and popes. <laughs> we don't go to a magisterium. Um, we are responsible for our own order. You see that throughout the New Testament, right? Yeah, it's amazing to me that we sometimes lose sight of the fact that the letters of the New Testament were, were written to individual churches, to communities uh, scattered across Asia um, in the first century. And these were local churches that were responsible for their own order. Autonomy means that the church solely under the Lordship of Jesus Christ and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, selects its pastoral leadership, appoints deacons, determines its worship, decides financial matters, admits members, exercises discipline, and directs other church-related affairs without outside control or supervision other than the supervision of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is the head of the church, right? So, Autonomy means that the church is responsible for all those things, okay? So being autonomous then, point two there, being autonomous, a church recognizes no governmental control over faith and religious practice. Um, a church is to establish its own governmental control. Uh, although churches obey the laws of governments related to certain matters, they refuse to recognize the authority of governments in matters of doctrine, in matters of polity, in ministry. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 21, the Lord uh, says, A render to Caesar that which is Caesar, and to God those things which are God's. Right? And that's a principle that applies certainly in that specific context that takes place there in Matthew chapter 22. Uh, but also um, applies in a broad array of contexts with respect to the church. The church is not submitted in that sense to Caesar. Um, we're not submitted to governments. We are autonomous. Now, um, Baptists um, have, from their inception really, have upheld a separation of church and state. We're going to talk about that more uh, as we work through this series on the church. Um, Baptists have consistently rejected the efforts of secular governments or a government entity to dictate to a church what to believe, how to practice, how to worship, uh, how we should appoint elders or members who should or should not be members. That is at the discretion of each individual church because each individual church is autonomous, right? And we don't submit ourselves in that sense to um, parachurch organizations, like denominations, um, like um, um, associations of churches that then begin to lord it over uh, the members of their association or extra structures, extra biblical structures that are imposed upon the church. We see no examples of that in the New Testament. It simply doesn't exist. And when we think about, we, we'll, we'll talk about this more in the future, but when we speak about then the regulative principle Whatever we don't see uh, commanded or commended in the Bible is expressly forbidden in our worship or in our doctrine, in our practice, right? So we look to God's word then for warrant as to how we are to function, as how we are to operate, um, and we don't see those extra biblical 
parachurch hierarchical organizations or structures in the Bible. Uh, each church is an, an autonomous uh, body. Churches, as our confession says, churches may relate to one another, and they do, start, they do so in terms of fellowship. Uh, our confession refers to it as holding communion together. Right, and that holding communion together, that communion, the communion of saints, we're going to talk about that tonight, the communion of saints, the fellowship of the saints we see in the cause of the gospel, uh, we see in matters that exist between churches, like members transferring back and forth or people moving back and forth, but no individual group, organization exercises authority over the church. That church alone is responsible for its own uh, government and order. That's a principle of sola scriptura, right? The Bible alone is our supreme authority in all matters pertaining to faith and practice. And the regulative principle then applies. Uh, the New Testament recognizes no parachurch, no hierarchical governmental structure. Therefore, autonomous churches are responsible for church order, including governance. Okay, so point one then on your notes we're discussing the basis for the general use of a constitution. Why would we have a church constitution? Um, someone might say, right? You hear people will say sometimes, um, no creeds but Christ, no books but the Bible. Right? We shouldn't have anything that exists outside the Bible. Uh, we need help with sometimes systematizing what the Bible teaches. The Bible is a full, huge, um, rich, deep document. And sometimes with respect, what does the Bible teach about appointing elders? We need to systemize all that the Bible teaches about appointing elders. And then it's good to write that down so we know what the Bible teaches about appointing elders. And so that we have a basis or a framework on, what, on which we can agree on what the Bible teaches about appointing elders so that, you know, Frank or Sally or Tom who come into the church can say, well, I think the Bible says this about, no, 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 no. This is what we as a church believe the Bible teaches clearly about appointing elders and all that should come from scripture, but it helps us to systemize, systematize that good teaching, okay? Um, point one, the basis for its general use. One, necessary church order. And that order is a necessary function of our autonomy as a biblical church. Any questions about point one then on your notes? The basis for its general use. This is why we have a constitution. Okay, moving on to point two, good. Let's talk about next then, um, reasons for its specific form, all right? Reasons for its specific form. Why do we have it in the form? of a church constitution? Why is it arranged the way that it is? Why do we use this document in the way that we use it? There are practical reasons, and then there are legal reasons, right? Practical reasons and legal reasons. Let's first discuss the practical reasons together, okay? First, of the practical reasons, there are reasons that are for the help, the benefit, the blessing of the individual. Our London Baptist Confession of Faith, of 1689 in chapter 26 uh, on the church. Article 12, if you've got your church app, you can punch that in and be there in two seconds. Under Article 12, our confession says that as all believers are bound to join themselves to particular churches, when and where they have opportunity so to do, so all that are admitted under the privileges of a church are also under the censures and government thereof according to the rule of Christ. Okay? So now that's um, a bit of a loaded statement. Um, but it's a, a really good, really helpful statement with respect to your membership in local church, but in particular in our church, okay? What is, what is our confession saying there, chapter 26, article 12? First, all believers are bound to join themselves to particular churches. Um, it means that believers are to commit themselves, we would say through baptism and through membership, are to commit themselves to serve in particular local churches uh, in obedience to the command of Jesus Christ, right? It's, it's um, not biblical for people to float from church to church or to sit sort of on the outskirts, if you will, uncommitted, uninvolved, unengaged in a church. Believers are bound to join themselves to the church. Um, that's Point number one that the confession makes, and that's by the command of Jesus Christ. When and where they have opportunity so to do. 
Um, so that's why we would say to regular attenders here, right? Once you uh, visit our church, we want visitors to feel welcome. We want visitors to come. We want guests to be able to stay with us. Why? Because we want them to get to know us. We want them to understand who we are, what we believe, why we believe it, what we do and why we do it. We're very intentional about the things that we do here, very specific about what we do here, and that's for a very good reason. And so anyone that comes, we want to give them time to get to know that and to get to understand that. By the same token, we want to get to know them, don't we? (laughs) Right? We have a responsibility um, with who comes into the membership of the local church. We'll talk about it in a minute why that's important and um, the, the things that we should consider in admitting members to the church. But for that member, it's really important to understand what they're getting themselves into. Um, they are bound to join themselves. And when they join, and we, I say this on a regular basis uh, to new members, uh, we're not joining you. <laughs> You're joining us, right? You're joining us. We're not joining you. And that's a good perspective to keep in mind. Uh, you, you need to understand what you're getting yourself into. Okay. Um, so that they're, they're bound to, to join themselves to particular churches so that they are admitted unto the privileges of the church. When they join themselves to the church, they're admitted to the privileges of the church. Well, what are those privileges? Right, what, are, what are those privileges? Now, I can, as I say that statement, I can just, things pop into my head, you know, pop into my head all the blessings and privileges of the church. But um, many times, the blessings and privileges of membership in a church um, go beyond those things that might immediately pop into your head that are oftentimes associated with the blessings of just being a Christian, right? The blessings of fellowship, the blessings of communion with the saints. But you also have privileges of membership that, that regular attenders or guests do not enjoy. Where are those benefits or privileges? Where are they outlined? Where are they listed? In our Constitution, right? In our Constitution. You have benefits of being a member of a local church, but you also have um, responsibilities of membership. Where are those responsibilities uh, listed? They're listed in our Constitution. Our Constitution is not an exhaustive or a comprehensive list of those blessings and responsibilities, but it is a representative list uh, and a very important list if you're going to exercise responsibilities of membership among us, okay? You're going to find those in the Constitution. Uh, Also, though, when you bind yourselves to a particular church, you're submitting yourselves to the censures of the church. This is extremely important, right? Um, Our confession, they are also under the censures and government thereof. So by becoming a member of the church, you submit yourself willingly, voluntarily, under the censures or the discipline and of the, under the governance of this church. Now, obviously, the censures or the discipline of this church is explained in the Bible. The government of this church is explained in the Bible. But what our Constitution enables us to do is to systematize all of that teaching, right? The various texts related to discipline, right? Matthew chapter 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, right? Several texts that deal with discipline. How are, how are we to understand those texts? How do we apply those texts in practice? It's laid out in our Constitution. It's laid out in the documents of our governance, those documents of good order, When we think about censure, when we think about government, when we think about discipline, when we think about rights and responsibilities of membership, we outline those in a systematic way in our Constitution um, so that we can easily see and refer to those um, in matters of practice, okay? So you're submitting yourself under the censures of the church, you're submitting yourself under the government of the church, and that, lastly in our confession, that's according to the rule of Christ, according to the rule of Christ, points us back to the Bible uh, and points us back to the regulative principle or sola scriptura, that how we govern ourselves, how we conduct ourselves uh, should be according to the Bible. Whatever is commanded or commended, that is what we want to do. That which is not commanded or commended is forbidden in our practice or in our worship. Okay, so those are practical reasons to the individual. What about practical reasons for our body as a local church? Corporate reasons, not just individual reasons, but corporate reasons. 
Well, um, our Constitution then becomes a means by which we endeavor to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Um, years ago, many of you, you old-timers here, <laughs> we got many of them in the room. Uh, old, we got many new-timers in the room too. But uh, you old-timers uh, will remember um, back when uh, you know, we were going through a period of difficulty or a period of trial in our church, how everything began to be questioned, right? Everything was held up to a scrutiny. And there is a sense in which that is good, right? Uh, everything is held up to scrutiny. Everything is, uh, should be questioned, and it should be questioned according to Scripture. Uh, a lot of times when you get these uh, bodies, like um, many churches, for example, where just over a period of time, things devolve in a little more than just base traditionalism. You end up following the commandments of men, teaching those commandments of men as doctrines of God, and you uh, wind up in all kinds of, of error and trouble. Um, so we don't want to um, uh, give ourselves over to just base traditionalism. Everything is up for scrutiny and should be scrutinized uh, under the word of God. And so if anybody, if, if, the, if, if someone fresh out of the oven, they've been converted three minutes. They walk up to me and say, you guys are doing this, but this is what it says in the Bible and they're right. <laughs> what are we gonna do? Uh, that minute, I'm, I'm committed. I'm, we're, we, we're a pledge to one another that that minute, that thing is changing, right? Because that's what the Bible teaches and we need to be obeying the Bible and not the tra traditions of men. And so uh, that is always up for scrutiny. However, um, we are very intentional here. And we, we try to be, Lord help us, try to be as thoughtful as we can about what we do and why we do it. And so many of those things, uh, given time, have been um, considered under the searing spotlight of God's word. And we have carefully, and I believe um, with a clear conscience before God, faithfully uh, um, set those practices in place in a way that we believe honors the Lord and uh, esteems the Lord's church. And so um, that systematizing then of those questions and issues of doctrine and practice that we've tried to be careful about working through, our systematizing of those things then becomes a means by which we protect or ende endeavor labor to maintain our unity, the unity of the Spirit, in the bond of peace, such that uh, during those times of volatility like we w w went through in the past, when somebody comes up and says, why are we following this 1689 thing? There are too many things here that we would disagree with. And I'm like, who's the we? Do you have a mouse in your pocket? No, 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 we, we believe, we hold to the 1689 London Baptist Convention. That's not something we're going to change. Why do we do expository preaching? Why would we, we should be a topical, no, 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 no. We, we have determined that expository preaching is what we're going to be fundamentally about. And here's why we have um, agreed together to be committed to that uh, form of preaching and teaching in, in the Lord's church, right? Um, these fundamental things, um, what a document like a constitution, a confession, or a covenant, what those documents do is uh, protect ourselves corporately from what can be the shifting sands of man's preferences and opinions given time, right? It should be really difficult, and it is, to change your constitution or to change your confession or to change your covenant. Right at the time when all that volatility was taking place, people rightly began to think to themselves, is our covenant something that still stands or is it something we need to completely scrap and do over, right? And after length, these things don't happen in a moment either, right? If somebody comes up to you and says, Listen, we need to amend our constitution and we need to do it by Tuesday. That is ample reason in and of itself not to do it by Tuesday, right? We're, we, we need to take our time. It needs to take a long period of time, and, and it did, right? We, we um, you know, for example, that, that real difficulty, the trials in our church at that time, uh, that was, you know, 2012. It seems like a lifetime ago, and 2012 seems so recent, uh, 
it seems like a lifetime ago, but we, we ended up over a period of a couple of years thinking through all those issues and um, rewrote our constitution in 2014 uh, to reflect those things that we had learned. But it was two years of dealing with those things and thinking through those things. And two years is a very short amount of time, right? Um, we should, this, this, uh, our constitution should be more ensconced, if you will, over years and years of use. Um, and it should be difficult to amend. Um, it, so it, it, it becomes then a means. The word of God is what stands behind the constitution. The word of God is what the constitution reflects. The word of God is timeless. And so our constitution then becomes a means by which um, the Lord, through his word, um, protects uh, our unity and our peace around those things we've determined are important to church governance, church polity, uh, our faith and practice. Okay, any, any questions or thoughts about that? Uh, really important um, for that reason. Um, secondly, with regard to corporate reasons or corporate benefits to a constitution, it's a means of our protection. Um, the Lord, uh, we do not put our faith or trust in chariots or horses. Our trust is in the living God, uh, but our God uses means. And we are to be wise and we are to be prudent. And our constitution is a means through which God um, may protect our church. And I use that word may uh, on purpose. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, so we've talked about the reasons for its specific form. There are practical reasons. Secondly, there are practical reasons, including both individual reasons and corporate reasons. Secondly, there are legal reasons. We need to move along here. We can um, actually get to talk about the Constitution itself. Legal reasons. Um, we talked about church autonomy, right? There is a relationship between that autonomy uh, and the state. So when we get into our series on the church and we're going to talk about the church and the state and we're going to talk about um, uh, something I've been reading about lately called sphere sovereignty, sphere sovereignty. Let me give you an example briefly. Um, God has created institutions. One of the institutions that God has created is the church. Another institution that God has created is the family. Another institution that God has created is government, right? Government. Governments are instituted by God, Romans chapter 13, right? So uh, governments are instituted by God. In each of those spheres, there is responsibility. There is sovereignty over responsibilities. There is a stewardship given to each of those spheres of authority, right? Uh, Abraham Kuyper, a uh, Dutch reformer, or a Dutch theologian, uh, referred to that as sphere sovereignty. And what happens often, often, is one of those spheres will um, grasp for itself more sovereignty than it is strictly and biblically entitled to, and like the River Jordan, it will overflow its banks <laughs> into other spheres. Now, in history, we've seen that happen frequently with the, with the church, haven't we? Where the church begins to act like the state, and the church begins to imprison people, and uh, um, it's it's um, an unbiblical extension of Israel's theocracy into the new covenant church, where it doesn't belong, and the church begins to um, grasp for itself um, uh, a, a sovereignty, if you will, that doesn't properly belong to it. Jesus Christ says, my kingdom is not of this world, okay? We'll talk about that when we get there. Um, what we see in our day and what we've seen most frequently throughout history is government overspilling its banks into a sphere where it does not belong. And that's what we see principally right now. Uh, I think the, um, those who... Uh, um, wrote our constitution, our United States constitution, would be sickened and disgusted by the encroachment of our government into the sphere sovereignty of the church. And that's why it's so important that we begin to talk about that uh, as a church here very soon. So um, 
but there is this, this relationship between church and state, and that relationship has been defined in terms of something called the church autonomy doctrine. Uh, the church autonomy doctrine or ecclesiastical extension or ecclesiastical abstention. Uh, what that um, does, what the church autonomy doctrine, we're talking about legal terms now, is it establishes a constitutional denial of jurisdiction. In other words, the state, the government, has no jurisdiction in ecclesiastical matters. Um, the, the church autonomy doctrine, by definition, establishes a constitutional denial of jurisdiction grounded in the free exercise clause of the First Amendment, right? The free exercise of religion clause in the First Amendment. Rationale for this is that courts do not have the competence or the capacity to decide questions of doctrine, religious doctrine, and civil courts must not make what amounts to religious pronouncements. And we see the court attempting to do that on a regular basis, but courts aren't equipped, aren't capable of doing that. They have no competence to do that. Our Constitution prevents them from doing that, restricts them from doing that, and the Bible says they shouldn't be doing that, okay? Now, this has been upheld uh, in the history of our country over decades and decades, in particularly in uh, 2002 case law, McKelvey versus Pierce. Listen to some of the things that the court, it's like, this is continuously upheld, this court um, agreed upon ecclesiastical jurisdiction. Listen to what um, is said in this decision. Uh, the doctrine, this doctrine, church autonomy doctrine, is rooted both in both of the religious clauses of our Constitution, protecting a church's freedom to regulate its own internal affairs by prohibiting civil court review of internal ch church disputes involving matters of faith, doctrine, church governance, and polity. It uh, puts a distinction between the two. The essence of church autonomy is that the church should be run by duly constituted church authorities and not by legislators, administrative agencies, labor unions, disgruntled lay people, or other actors lacking authority under church law. Right? Church autonomy is also rooted in case law that affirms the fundamental right of churches to decide for themselves, free from state interference, matters of church government, as well as those of faith and of doctrine. Um, in other words, there is this ecclesiastical jurisdiction that is recognized between the sphere sovereignty of the state and that of the church. And it's important that we maintain the distinction or the difference between those two. Now, um, one of the reasons that we say there is a legal reason for having a church constitution is that um, it's not, it doesn't function well to go into the courts of the state with your Bible and say, this is what the Bible says, so this is what we're going to do. The Bible is interpreted, and the state understands it, interpreted by the various autonomous churches that exist. And those churches have their own um, understanding, their own uh, codification, if you will, of church polity. Where is that church polity to be expressed or codified? It's expressed or codified in our Constitution. And the state, uh, those court jurisdictions of the state recognize or acknowledge church constitutions. So we put our constitution together. One of the, the reasons that we put our constitution together is for the benefit, for the blessing of the people coming to our church, for you, so that you understand, so that we understand together what we're all about and why we are all about it. But then secondly, it's to help us in our relationship with the state or with the courts. And in that sense, it becomes a document that protects us also, right? There are many things that, in, um, that are connected to this, uh, many reasons why that's important. Okay, um, that ecclesiastical protection that comes from um, our use of a document like a church constitution um, comes through or arises from membership. Now, when somebody's here for a period of time, it is assumed that those who are here for a period of time are submitting themselves to our practice here, right? So it's, um, there's a common law, if you will. If you're here for a period of time, uh, it's acknowledged 
and holds up in court on a regular basis, that you're submitting yourselves to the way that we do things here, and you're doing that um, by coming, by attending. But this ecclesiastical prote protection from our church really arises from membership. It's the people of God here coming together in our joint membership and saying, these are the things that we believe. Here's how we are going to function. This is what we believe that our government should be about. Here's how we are to practice the things that we believe. And we're saying as a church body, this is what it is. And we've systematized that in this document called a church constitution so that when that or if that is challenged, um, we can say, no, 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 here's where, where it is and here's what we believe. And that's why if you read our constitution also, you'll see a lot of scripture referenced in our constitution. Scripture is referenced throughout. It's not, you know, some constitutions you'll see is sort of like these boilerplate boilerplate documents that have nothing in them but a couple of um, statements. We loaded ours with scripture. Why? Because it establishes jurisdiction. <laughs> the state has no jurisdiction. The Bible has jurisdiction. Questions? Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Uh, kind of a side note from what we're talking about. If someone's been coming here for like two years, but they're not an official member, haven't signed the covenant, can they still be put under church discipline? Yeah, that's a very good question. And where would you find one place? Where would you find the answer to that question? In our church constitution. Yes, that's a good question, brother. And yes, like that's a really important question, right? Church discipline is to be practiced on members of the church. So we would not practice church discipline on a non-member. Somebody from a biblical or constitutional basis, um, somebody explain to me why that is. Why would we not practice discipline on a non-member, someone who's not a member of our church? Anybody know? Nancy, want to take a stab at it? Yeah. <laughs> well, they may not be believers, because when True people that. are become members of the church, they're members. I mean, they're 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 believers. We're affirming their profession of right. faith. Right. Yeah. So that's a maybe a portion of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't yes. Know very good. Very good. That. Yeah. One point. Right. When somebody joins our church, we're affirming them. We're affirming their profession of faith. So, Josh. Oh, Michael. Um, I was going to say that they haven't officially given consent to uh, to that as of yet. Yeah, you're getting there, right? Yes, so they're, they're, they have not voluntarily yet, have not voluntarily submitted themselves to the, as our confession of faith states it, the censures and the government of our church, right? Josh. In uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 12, it says, uh, for what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do not judge those who are inside. Very good. So there's a clear <clears throat> distinction between those who are inside the church and those who are outside. Yeah. Amen. The and how are we to um, determine or to delineate, uh, distinguish those who are on the outside from those who are on the inside? One of the ways that we do that is through church membership. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Question. Yes, sir, brother. Morning, brother. Good morning. <laughs> If someone has been attending our church and has made a profession of faith for two years, mm -hmm. but is living in a practice of sin, we yeah. will deal with them. Yes, and yeah, thank you, brother, for bringing up that distinction. So um, there is, in this, our, or our constitution also discusses this. There is a distinction between what we would consider to be formative church discipline and corrective church discipline, right? So um, anyone who comes to our church, like uh, um, according to Matthew 18, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, anyone who would come to our church, we would um, approach them in sin and deal with them according to the Bible, right? But in terms of excommunication, in terms of uh, saying we no longer affirm your profession of faith uh, as a believer. We reserve that corrective church discipline only for members of the church. What we would do in the case of someone here who was um, in unrepentant sin that way, um, if that um, rose to the degree that we are um, working through Matthew 18, for example, with them, and we reach that point of telling it to the church, we're going to ask them to leave. Right? Um, in a sense, you can stay here, but you can't cause trouble. 
Uh, so we're gonna ask you to leave the church. But the censures of the church or the, the corrective discipline of the church is reserved for those who are members of the church, those who have voluntarily submitted themselves to the censures and government of our church. Um, so in that sense, excommunication, the practice of the church um, for its members. Last question, Josh. Hey, brothers. Oh, just another comment. If Thank someone's you. been here for like maybe one year or even a little bit more than that, we would ask them why haven't they become members yet? Yes. Yeah. So there, and if they don't want to become members of the church, we would ask them to seek membership elsewhere. Yeah, very good. So even before, you know, it it does happen. You know, where there's church discipline, we have to deal with sin when it comes. Mm. Oh, I don't think that was my voice. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, if they've been here for a good amount of time, we would encourage them to become members. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, our confession, right? Um, they are bound to join themselves to a local church um, by the command of Christ. So yeah, if, if um, we will tell folks, um, and we have, and uh, if you can't join here, then go somewhere where you can join. Uh, you need to be a, a member of a church. And part of that is the accountability that comes with um, church governance, church poly, polity in particular, um, discipline. Last minute here, and then we're going to have to close out to get ready for the morning service. Um, you've got your copy of the Constitution. We've, we've talked about, uh, I think those two things are important. We don't usually get an opportunity to talk about the basis for the general use of a Constitution and then the reasons for its specific form, in particular those um, individual, corporate, and legal reasons. So I wanted to go over those with you. But if you have a hard copy of our Constitution, we've got more available at the Welcome Desk if you'd like to have one. You've got it on the church app. I want to invite you, uh, take some time, maybe in fellowship, take some time with your family, just read through these various sections. I think they're very important. Article 6 on church membership, the qualifications for ch church membership, uh, admission to church membership, responsibilities, um, Article E, uh, responsibilities and privileges of church membership, uh, termination of church membership, um, Article 7, an entire article dedicated to church discipline, how we view church discipline, how we practice church discipline, very, very important. And uh, this is, you know, we, we go through this with new members because this is um, what you as a member of our church are submitting yourself to in the practice of the church. Now, we believe that this accurately and faithfully represents what the Bible teaches uh, and how we are to practice, but this fleshes out, um, gives practicality to what we believe the Bible teaches. So really, really important. Um, the things that you're responsible for voting for, we're, we're um, uh, considered uh, an elder-led governance, an elder-led polity, but we, for the sake of unity and for the sake of our peace, involve uh, the congregation on many, many decisions and votes. And so you have a responsibility uh, to vote on in many, many cases. Uh, admitting members, we involve the congregation in. Cases of church discipline, we involve the congregation in. Appointing elders and deacons, we involve the church uh, in. In amending this constitution requires a three-fourths vote of our membership to amend the constitution. To buy property would require a vote of our congregation, right? So many things in which, um, many ways in which, although we are elder-led, because we believe that's what the Bible teaches, in many cases, we are congregational in terms of the decisions that we're, we're going, to be, going to be making because we involve the congregation in that. Okay, that suffices for our very uh, top-level overview of the church constitution. We'll look at the covenant next week. If you have questions, please feel free to come and ask. We'll be happy to discuss that with you. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the basis that your word gives us, a good, sure uh, guide uh, your truth um, that um, gives us all the instruction that we need to govern ourselves properly. Thank you for um, the commendation of, of Paul and others to good order in the church and help us, Lord, to be faithful uh, to establish, maintain, sustain, and practice good order, doing everything here decently and in order uh, for your glory and for our own blessing and benefit, for our own protection. Uh, help us to um, faithfully adhere to what the Word of God clearly teaches on these things. Um, help us to uh, maintain, endeavor, labor to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace 
through the use of these means like a church constitution. And although, Lord, we understand that you are the one who protects us, we pray, Lord, that you would um, help us to operate in wisdom um, by implementing a document like this uh, to um, protect us from those that would seek to undermine the church or do us harm. And I pray, Lord, that we would look to you for that protection, trust you for it, and Lord, please protect us. We love you and depend upon you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.